I think we can start the meeting. Just two minutes to introduce you. Yeah. So hello everyone. I hope you are all doing fine. Thank you for coming to the Finemel Create conferences. Today we are pleased to introduce Chiang Gao, PhD candidate in applied mathematics at Concordia University and also recipient of the Finemel Create Grant. The topic of his presentation is bound price prediction with filter-based RNN and arbitrage-free regularization. Some reminders. The meeting will be recorded. Please put your microphone on mute. And if you have any question, please wait until the end of the presentation to ask them. Otherwise, you can write them now in the chat. So let's give the floor to Chiang now. Hello, everyone. Glad to meet you today. So today I will present my uh, subject, uh, which is uh, uh, done in my internship. So the subject is uh, about the application of machine learning in bound price prediction. Uh, so uh, in this representation, I will focus on mostly about my experience on the data selection and uh, how to connect the financial model with machine learning and uh, something about the neural network selection and also talk a bit about the training related problems. So I divided my topic into three parts. First, I will introduce some basic background of the bond market and uh, discuss a little bit about our prediction problem. Then I will introduce some uh, financial concepts about the bond pricing models. And uh, I, will re I will connect it uh, how we use this uh, financial model with the machine learning neural networks. And uh, in the last uh, section, I will discuss about uh, uh, the prediction result, and I will talk a little bit about uh, uh, the improvement method we can do. So first, uh, uh, we look into the data of the bond. So this table shows uh, what the bond data looks like. So for each bond, we have a unique ID, which is called icing, and uh, we have an issue time, maturity time, and the tenor. Tenor is the remaining time from the trading date to the maturity date. And the coupon rate uh, tells us uh, how much payment we can get from this uh, bond. And the coupon frequency here shows uh, how frequently we can get this payment. So two means it's a semi-annual payment. We got two, uh, two payments uh, each year. And the coupon class shows here it's fixed. And we also have other float rate coupon bond. And this instrument time of, and the convertible type is uh, to help us to figure out uh, what kind of uh, bond data we need. So based upon this uh, coupon class, we have uh, three divisions. So first, the uh, trend reviews, which is a zero coupon bond, uh, which means we do not pay any coupon payments. And then secondly, we have a treasury bond and a note, which is usually paid uh, semi-annually. And for corporate bond, we have many payments. It's um, most appear with uh, quarterly or monthly. So first, uh, we choose what kind of data we need for the pricing problem. So we have three conditions to figure out the bond data. So we choose only fixed coupon payment. So we, uh, we also keep a non-callable bond because there are some bond that embedded with the call options that can be uh, can be terminated before the maturity. And also we keep only non-convertible bond. So which means uh, this bond cannot be converted to some equity or stocks. And the last three conditions is related to the liquidity and the pricing problem. And the last, the tenor we choose is greater than three months because if the tenor is less than three months, uh, those bond will have a liquidity problem and uh, because they are highly traded uh, so the pricing also will be biased. So next I will introduce about the prediction problem. So first we compare about the bond and the stock. Stock is the equity, bond is a kind of loan. So, and also the bond has a shorter life than the stocks. Usually a bond will be around a couple of years and then the new bond can be issued at any time. 
And the last problem about the bond is the liquidity problem, because sometimes this bond may be traded only once a month. So the data is very sparse for the illiquid bond issuers. So that's the most problem we are facing. And later on, we'll tackle how to address for the bond data. So the first one I'm going to introduce about the approach is a classic approach. So in some more traditional papers, the people predict the bond price, uh, which is equivalent to predict the yield curves. And some statistic model related to the yield curve problem is the uh, autoregression model and the filter using the Bayesian inference. And here we are going to combine this uh, financial models with machine learnings. So in the financial model, we'll introduce about the Nansen Siegel term structure and with the arbitrage free regularization. And we use the uh, filters to do the prediction. Here we're going to introduce a common filter to predict the yield curve and the particle filter to predict the bond prices. Now we will introduce how to connect the financial model and the filters using RNN. So in our model, we have uh, four layers that connecting between the model and the filters. So firstly, let's look, up, let's look into how to pricing a bond. So we use the first bond as an example. Well, I plot a timeline here. So suppose this uh, date you purchase this uh, bond and you should pay the close the price, this amount. But actually this is not the real price for the bond. We should uh, sub subtract the accrued interest to get the real price, which is the clean price. That's the real price we are gonna to use. And then after you're buying a bond, you will get the payment at the certain time. So this is a coupon rate equal to 2.5. Now we divide by the coupon frequency. We will get the payment equal to this amount of the face value until the maturity. And at the maturity, we also get paid with this amount from the face value. So I here I put an equation how to price this bond if we know the future rate at this time, then we can discount off this uh, future payment to get the real price. In our model, we choose the Nelson Siegel term structure to describe the yield curve. So in this plot, this solid curve represents the yield curve observed at this trading date. In this model, we have three risk variables. We call it as x1, x2, and x3. The remaining parameters are fixed, which is gonna determined by this lambda and tau. Tau is the time from the uh, trade date until the payment time. So this gives us the bond of pricing formulas. It's the summation of the discounted payment. And I simplify all this notation to be more clear to see these uh, equations. And then firstly, we are gonna to choose the data from uh, all these raw data. First, we're gonna to estimate about this yield curve. Because you see, if I plot all this bond data in this picture, some bond uh, seems uh, not close to this yield curve because this reason we will do some filtering to drop off these uh, outliers and we'll keep the most of the bond that will describe a smooth curve connected yield curve. So in this training, we will minimize this target function. This is from the pricing formula and this is from the observed bond price. So by minimize this error, we find the optimal parameter for this lambda is equal to this value. And also we can extract the state of variable x1, x2, x3 from day to day. So next, if we plot this as a 3D plot, and this gives us a yield service. So at each day, we will have a yield curve, and we plot it sequentially, we will have this yield service. This picture gives us the plot of the state variable. So this shows the state of variable x1 and x2 and x3. So this gives us the evolution from day to day. So in our Models, we are going to do the prediction for this uh, 
state variable, and then we can use the predict the state variable to price the predicted bound and uh, the predicted yield. So before we go to the model, we still need to do some data work because after the first step of filtration, we still find that the data is uh, very difficult to use as a uh, input because uh, for each issuer, we have a different amount of bond that treated daily. So for example, we may have uh, 10 bonds treated today, but next day we may have 20 bonds treated tomorrow. So based upon this fact, we need to select a certain amount of bond that treated from day to day. So we look into the total data and we do some statistics and we split the bond up according to their tenants into three terms. So first is the short term bond, which is uh, the bond with tenor between less than two years. Second uh, is a mid term bond with tenors between two years and uh, 15 years. Third is a bond in long terms, which has a tenor greater than 15 years. So after some statistics, we find that the short term bond take part about 20% uh, in the total data and the mid term bond uh, it takes uh, 67 percent, and the long-term bond takes about 30, uh, 30 percent. So based upon this uh, statistic, we choose a daily bond with 14 short term bond and 45 mid-term term bond, and nine bond from the long-term bond. So basically, we have uh, six, seven daily bond in each day. So this shows the bond data after the selection. Here we choose the tenor, coupon rate, frequency, and the clean price, these four features as our input. Also, we also extract the yield curve at each day. And this is uh, much more better than this data. And we can also use this as a input. So here I present some uh, math uh, equations that uh, how I model this state of variables. Based upon the previous plot, we can see that uh, this state variable has a mean reverting process. So I model it in this process. And also we, ver we can verify this assumption by this augmented Dick Fuller test. So the, after this uh, statistical test, uh, we find the p-value is uh, greater than the critical value. So we can accept the hypothesis that they are the mean reverting process. And also from this uh, theoretical structure, we can obtain the average excess return, which is uh, quantified by this equation. And so if this equation equal to zero, then we can get the arbitrage free pricing formulas. And this will give us the regularization in the prediction process. So next, uh, we're gonna to connect how we use the machine learning to model these uh, financial models. So first in the models, we have three basic variables in the state of variables. So first is the kappa, theta, and the sigma. We consider using a neural network to map the input to these variables. And we consider using a sequential model to do this work. So in this uh, mappings, we split the variable into two sets. The first set is the interpretable parameter, which is uh, the kappa, theta, and sigma, which has uh, solid uh, economic meanings. And the second, uh, this over five represents for the neural network parameters, which is the uh, uninterpretable parameters. And now our objective is to use uh, RNN to, uh, to learn the movement of the state variable from the historical data. And we use a neural network to connect all this layer together. And we will deploy a filter method to predict the state variable. And then we can calculate the predicted yield and the prices. And last, we use a regularizations to restrict the state variable and the state parameters in an arbitrary free condition. Here, we have four layers in our models. The first layer will deal with the input and will output some uh, hidden output. So first, we're going to check what kind of uh, data we have and what kind of output we want. So if we use the yield data, 
we have uh, 3D tensors. The first dimension represents the batch size. Second dimension means the sequential length. And thirdly, we have the feature size at each day. And now all the put will, will predict the same feature size and with the same batch size. But for the bond data, we have a 40 tensors. We have, uh, at each day, we have uh, n observed bond. For each bond, we have f feature size. So all the put, we will have a uh, n bond price predicted. So based upon this fact, we're gonna, we need to carefully select the models we need. So first though, we're gonna to focus on the sequential model, which using the recurrent neural networks. So under the recurrent neural networks, uh, the mostly used uh, layers uh, is the uh, long short term memory and uh, uh, gated uh, recurrent uh, unit. So these two basic cells, if we connect them into a recurrent neural network, we get the LSTM layer and the GRU layers. So if we use this layer, it will map a 3D tensor input to a 2D output. So this layer will match our first task to the yield input. Secondly, we can also consider the convolution LSTM, which is a map a 5D tensor input to a 4D tensor output. So this 5D tensor input is composed by sample size, which is a batch size and time size, row, column, and the channels. In the last three dimensions, this input is really represented by the image input. So for image input, we have a column and a row, and we have a three channel layers. Another recently introduced layer for the sequential model is the attention layers. It is similar to the LSTM, which is a workout 3D tensor to a 2D tensor. So here, next we're gonna introduce about the recurrent neural network in our model. We have a four parts. The first part is the input layer, which is gonna do this input and output work. And secondly, we'll have a state layer, which connect the model output to the state parameters. And now we will calculate the residual that is predicted from a previous state and from the new observed data. And now we will have the filter layer which is going to generate a new output. So we consider the image data, which have a three dimension. Here we have a bond data, which is a 2D dimension. But actually we can reshape this bond data as an image, just with a one channel data. And now we can use the convolution LSTM to work out the dimension reduction by this equation. So after this equation, we will get the desired shape for the output. Here, this uh, uh, explains what these uh, parameters stand for. Here is a kernel size, uh, which is um, the convolution uh, dimension. And here is the hidden units. We can choose this value such that this dimension equal to this, and then we can get the output, which is, uh, can be compressed into the vector. So the first uh, is the input layer. The input layer fit with the input data and generate some hidden output. We use a two connect the LSTM for the yield input. So this small y stand for the yield input. And we use a convolution LSTM and then connect with a standard LSTM for the bound input. This capital Y standard for the bound input. And first we're gonna to reshape this bound input. And after that, we're gonna do compress this output and connect it to a standard LSTM. So this C prime will give out the hidden output. Next, we're gonna connect this hidden output to the state layers. In the state layers, we deploy three standard dense layers. So we can map this hidden output to the desired state parameter, kappa, theta, and sigma. And we need to choose uh, activation carefully because uh, the kappa is a standard for the mean reverting speed. We would like to, it can be any values. So I set it as a linear uh, activation function. For theta, it is standard for the mean value for the state variable. 
and we want to it uh, to be confined in a certain range. So I choose the tan H, and for the sigma, I also choose the activation by tan H. And next, we're going to connect uh, with the uh, residual layers. In the residual layers, so we're going to calculate the prediction errors. So this bar, bar, bar value is the predicted values, and this uh, new observed input. So I calculate the error, and then we normalize it using the batch normalized uh, layer. And now I connect this uh, to a standard LSTM. With this hidden output, I reshape it into some uh, variance parameters, and we will use this later in the filter models. So in the filter layer, we implement the common filter and the particle filter. Here, I briefly show how these uh, two filters work. So for the common filter, it is a linear model to predict the yield values. So this uh, prediction step, this uh, from the common filter, and this uh, predict the state variable given the previous uh, uh, status. And this uh, predicted the yield value from this linear equation. In the particle filters, we're going to predict the price value, which is a nonlinear. So in this model, we're going to sample using this equation. So we have this dynamics. We can work out using the, like a sequential Monte Carlo simulations. We can sample many particles for this uh, x. And each i stand for the particles. And now we can calculate the bond price for each particle. And now we take the average value, which can be considered as the predicted value price, uh, bond prices. And now we can keep this resampling and proceed to generate new predictions. This plot shows how we link these uh, four layers together. So this shows a basic unit of the recurrent neural network. So in each unit, we have a four connected input layer, state layer, residual layer, and the filter layer. The problem that we're using this way is that we need to have a better understanding of uh, how these layers works because we are going to define the initial hidden state for each layers and we're going to tell the model how this data is uh, passed through these layers. And after we finish this uh, uh, step, we're going to output the predicted uh, state variable along with the predicted uh, state parameters. This is going to be used for the arbitrage uh, quantifying. So next time uh, we can go to the loss function, the optimizers. So the, for the loss function, we can we use the simple MSE error for of the prediction error and uh, plus the regularization. The regularization is given by the p norm of the average excess return. In my uh, in my training, I said the p equal two. So this gives uh, calculations. And also we can set some alternative metric to monitoring for the testing set, which I choose a hit rate. The hit rate is uh, calculated by this way. So we consider about the spread. If the predicted price uh, is within the spread, then we can consider it as uh, good predictions. Otherwise it will count as a zero. Now I'm gonna introduce some about the optimizers. Uh, Based upon my experience, I tried with all these uh, optimizers. So the first uh, is a stochastical gradient descent, and we need to come with uh, momentum to prevent the oscillations. This will randomly shuffle the examples between uh, each training, and it will combine the gradient with the previous uh, updated gradient together. But in the training, this uh, converge very slowly and uh, it will give a locally optimal result. And second, uh, I try also try the other grid and the other delta and the IMS prop. These two are the adaptive uh, methods. So these two optimizers will reduce the uh, learning rate by a continuous decay rate. But the disadvantage is that these two optimizers will eventually get very small learning rates. So in the training, I find the most efficient optimizer is Adam. Adam is similar to stochastic gradient, but it combines with the first and the second order of momentum. So this gives the most efficient training result. And 
but some recent research gives us argue that in the long time training, the stochastic gradient descent with momentum seems to uh, outperform the other. But in my training, the convergence only takes like 30 to 50 training steps. So Adam works better for this uh, short time training. Uh, so here I'm gonna to show the prediction results. So the first day is the state variable. The three component I denoted by L, S, and C, which is stand for the X1, X2, and the X3. So this shows the one day ahead forecasting. In this training, I batch the data every one day. So this situation will have a, a monthly data and to predict the, the next day prediction. So here on the left, we have a lambda equal to zero, which has no regularization. This one, lambda equal to one, is including the regularization. But here, we cannot see much differences in the one day prediction because these are uh, too close to each other. So next, I'm gonna to try with a longer time horizon prediction. So I batch the data for every five days and then print the next five day prediction. Now we can see the differences. So from this picture, we can see that the green line, green line shows the result of the particle filters. The particle filter predicted the state variable seems uh, much more close to the real observation. And the green one shows a common filter predicted result. But for the common filter, you can see that uh, at some period, this common filter seems uh, uh, does not fit very well into the prediction, but uh, overall it uh, will give the good result. So next we're gonna to show this uh, different effect of this prediction when we plot it into the yield curve. So this shows the one day I had a yield curve prediction. We cannot tell too much differences, uh, including this regularization. And then we go to the five day prediction. Now we can see without this regularization, it uh, give a little bit larger errors, but this error is still less than like here, it's uh, less than 1%, it's 0.1%. But if we include the regularization, we see this uh, become much more close to the real result. And here in this type, this is the last day in the testing set, and this is uh, some data in the training set. So this in the testing set, we have a much, much better predictor in the tail part if we include the regularization. Now here I show only the testing results, and we compare the one day ahead prediction with five day ahead prediction. Here I use a metric, uh, so first the MAPE, stand for the mean absolute prediction error. RMSPE stand for the root mean square prediction error. And the MPE here stand for the mean percentage error. So this error will compare to the, the prediction error and divided by the bound price and then times 100. So in the calculation of the yield error, I use BIPs. So one BIPs equal to 0.01%. And the press error, I will use the real dollars. So first we check the yield errors. We check the mean absolute error. So in one day prediction, it is shows very good results. So the error is about uh, four bips one day ahead. And in five day ahead, it's uh, around nine bips. And if we go to the price, in the one day ahead the prediction, the price error is, uh, is no more than 20 cents. And in five days, it's, uh, it's around 30 cents. And here I list some uh, metric for the heat rate. So I list about the three tenor set and for each tenor set, I set a different spread. So for this tenor set, I set the spread as uh, 10 cents. This is a uh, 25 cents and this is 50 cents. And we can see that this two tenor set has very good prediction in both uh, one day and five day ahead. But for the uh, long-term bond, it does not uh, show a very good uh, hit rate because uh, we can see from the data set in the total data, we have only 13% for the long-term bond. That's why this prediction for the long-term bond is not very good. And also another reason for this bad prediction that the long-term bond is also has a, is it's very difficult to do the prediction than the short-time bond. So uh, to finish my presentation, I'm going to introduce some uh, 
techniques we can use to improve this prediction. So I'm going to talk a little bit from a four perspectives. So first of all, we can improve our theoretical structure. We can do some back testing and some error distribution to find out that uh, we have uh, this error distribution it's shaped like this. It's not a standard Gaussian distribution. If we compare it with a, a multivariate generalized Gaussian di distribution, we can find that it may fit well for this distribution, or we can have better fit with non-parametric distribution. But in this error distribution, we find the two problems. One is the excess uh, kurtosis. Another one, we have a very fat tails. And this can be seen from uh, this QQ plot. We compared about this uh, testing set with the training set. And also we show this QQ plot for this uh, testing result. We can see that the fat tail problem is uh, very severe. So to address these two problems, and this will improve our performance, this uh, first uh, improvement we can done. Secondly, we can uh, look into our data because in the training, we only select the full features, which is a very a small feature size for this bound data. And actually, we can choose more features which include uh, some ratio and quantitative attributes and the trading volumes and uh, some other like durations and other informations from the second market. And also for the data, we will talk a little bit later. And third method we can improve our result is through the training method. We can uh, change the error metric. If we want to have a higher hit rate, we can use the hit rate as a metric for the training. Also, we can have uh, another different training method, which is called cross validations. So first, I'm going to talk a little about this data selection. Uh, first, the method we can use is the PCA analysis to find out the most important features from this data set. And then we can, we can use XGBoost to, to choose some relevant data found together. Or if the, for some times so we're dealing with the corporate data, so we do not have uh, enough daily observations. We can use clusterings to put uh, to combine different corporate data together to have uh, so that they have a uh, similar behaviors. And by the error metric, we can put a weight for the sample error. If we want to improve the prediction for the long term bound, we can put uh, a higher weight for the long term bound to improve this from the training metric. And last thing I'm going to discuss about uh, is the uh, k-folded cross validation. So this picture shows uh, how it works. So we divided uh, the total training set into k uh, into k partitions. At each partition, we choose different uh, partition as a testing set. So at the first training, we're going to use this set for the training set uh, for the testing set. And in the second training, we will use another partition as a testing set. So eventually we're gonna do this uh, K times training. We'll get a much better results. But this is uh, another problem because if we're using this method, all this training data information will eventually leak into the training result. result. So sometimes we, may, we need to uh, keep out some uh, testing set as an uh, untouched uh, Data set and uh, after the K folded uh, cross validation, we're going to use this uh, untouched data set for the testing result. So that's uh, my presentation. Mm, uh, any questions? Thank you, Chen. Great talk. Any questions? Hello. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Well, I have a question about your model. Uh, I wanted to, I was wondering uh, if the model was able to um, to, to compute uh, 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 the bond price if the interest rate turns negative uh, in our context. Uh, yes, we are going to compute the bond price using these formulas. Um, but uh, it's got, not going to give any negative values in the calculations. 
but you're using a like a VASID check for the factors. So there's no reason why it couldn't lead to like a negative interest rate. Yeah, the reason is that this model is uh, very robust. So no matter what kind of value input you get for these variables, uh, in my check, uh, this model will never give the negative values in the pricing. No, but it's not about the bond prices. It's about the interest rates. Yes. Yeah, interest rates that will also never going to be negative. But that doesn't seem correct because these X factors could become negative. Yeah, actually, this combination can give the negative interest rate, but for the specific data we have, I never got the negative interest rate. So if we look into this yield data, I checked. So if I also check the yield at the zero, it's never going to touch negative. But in any case, the, I think the question is about recently there has been some negative yields in some markets. So that wasn't in your data set, but from the structure of your model, I don't think it would prevent you from, from considering them. Yeah, that's right. So this model structure by this, uh, so here the data is from 2017 to 2019. So until this time, I never see the negative yield. But actually this process will give the negative yield negative interest rate because it's uh, mean reverting without any restrictions for the parameters and the related uh, forward rate that will have uh, negative values. Does it answer your question? Uh, you need to unmute yourself. Oh, sorry. Yes, thank you. I, I thought I was uh, mute. Sorry. Any more questions? Um, hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, but I'm not quite sure I understood how you tune your hyperparameters. Could you elaborate more on that? Uh, the hyperparameters uh, we're gonna in, we're not gonna to consider about uh, here. Here we have a uh, two standard uh, LSTM. So when for this two standard LSTM, it's not very difficult to tune the hyperparameters uh, because it's gonna depend uh, on this output. And for this uh, state layer, so we're gonna need to specify. Uh, what's the hyperparameters for this part and this part. And for the bond input, you are going to choose these parameters uh, carefully because uh, here we're going to use a simple result just to try to map this uh, uh, 2D input uh, as a 1D output. So this gives the dimension reduction formulas. So here we're gonna set uh, this uh, convolution LSTM with one filters. So the last channel will equal to one and this uh, dimension we're gonna give to one. So we're gonna choose the standard setting for the stride which equal to one and one which means the moving step along the X axis and the Y axis and the padding is equal to zero, we do not padding zeros. And so KH gonna equal to the feature sets of the bond data. And the first dimension H equal to this output. And we, after some calculation, we find out this uh, kernel size need to equal to the integer of this uh, division. So that's uh, choose for the hyperparameters. And then in the training, we also need to tune this hyperparameters. We also need to check whether this big value and the small values give the good result. But eventually I find that uh, uh, based upon the training efficiency, I find this value should not set very big. So small choice for the hidden unit will also give very good result. So in this reason, we are going to reduce the model capacity by setting a small hyperparameters. So that's uh, the hyperparameters. You need to check the bias variance uh, result, and uh, also you need to 
check with the training speed and to determine whether it needs a large capacity or a small capacity. Because sometimes uh, a set of with, with a very large capacity, I find it's uh, gonna give a very good uh, in-sample training result, but for the other sample test, it's gonna very variant results. So we find this uh, bad result, we're gonna do decrease the model capacities and choose a small uh, hyperparameters. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think you need to unmute yourself. Oh, sorry. I say thank you, um, I understood. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions? Other questions? Okay, so we'll say uh, th thank you to Tian. Thank you again for everything. Great talk and uh, have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks. Thank Bob. you. Have a nice day. Bye.